All right, so today what we're going to cover is essentially uh, we're not going to walk through the challenge itself today. Um, and today I'm also going to be covering two days worth of topics so that tomorrow you can just, you know, once the mock interviews finish, you can just kind of get at it and, and move, move on to either the React challenge for the day or your, your personal projects. It's up to you. Um, so I'm going to create a file today. I mean, we're just going to cover some basic concepts so that we're all on the same page. So I'll just talk uh, React view.js, something like that. And I'm going to subble React review. All right. So, you know, today we're going to continue on with new site three, just like we continued on, where it's a continuation off of new site two. So you're going to be copying everything from new site two over into new site three. And there's more things available for you there. Um, let's determine some, uh, I guess, some terms to get us all on the same page. What's a React component? What would you say a React component is? Like a class that's rendered on another page, like in the brackets, like you call it in a in render block, and it's like mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe better call it a method. And you pass it props. It's not a method. I like the first one. I prefer class. If you're thinking in like Ruby terms, like it is a class. As a render, render is a method. Yeah, render is a method on it. But in the end, no, it's that's mostly right. Yeah, it's it's you're going to think of a React component as a reusable piece of code. Like a Ruby class is a reusable piece of code. So it's a reusable reusable piece of code that simply returns markup, and that's that's that render that shows up out to the screen. Um, what are some things that every single React component has? The two big concepts that we've been talking about for a while. Return? Yes, I'm saying like in terms of like, components. what's that? Components. Components. Uh, React, no, I'm saying like each component has two things inside of it. Possibly a constructor. Uh, possibly a constructor, that's right. What does the constructor have in it? Initializers. Initializers and something that starts with an S. Um, it's a five-letter word. State. State. Yeah. State. What is state? Um, <clears throat> something we define, right? Yeah, it's something uh, that you define. It's it's built into every component. It's kind of like what it contains, or like um, almost like like variables almost. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's essentially state is essentially just a giant global not global, it's a, it's a hash that's available to the entire component. So it's like if you need to hold any sort of data, if that component needs to know anything, you can just like set the state right on that particular component. Um, the constructor, what does a constructor take as an argument? It's taking params, almost like a function, right? Yeah, it takes params, what are, what are those called? Oh. Those are called props, yeah. So we have a React component. Basically, it's a piece of reusable code that returns some sort of markup. State being basically a global JavaScript object or Ruby hash, if you want to think of it that way, that holds some sort of information that you'll need. And then props are the things that are passed down from one parent component into some components underneath that. So up to this point, we've been building our website using mostly static data. We've been reading from a file. And if you remember from yesterday, uh, I don't have it. Let me put it here. So up to this point, we've been mostly reading, um, I think there was an entire thing called news.json. They were just reading from a, from a static file, right? Which is okay just to learn how things are wired up. But the web doesn't work based off of reading specific files. We make API calls in the background. Uh, what? How have we made AP, How have we made web requests in JavaScript before? What was that technology called? It's a four-letter word. Starts with an A, has an X in it. Ajax. What does Ajax stand for? JavaScript and XML. Yeah, so AJAX okay. stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, and that's how we make requests 
a lot of times on the web, right? We used to, if you go down to the bottom of your Facebook page or a Twitter page, it seems like it never stops, right? Because in the background, it knows, the JavaScript knows when I scroll to the bottom of the page and the bottom of the page has been hit, I'm gonna make an Ajax request in the background to my server, get a bunch of stories, and then keep the thing spinning until it's ready to just load up the next section on the page so that it seems like there's an infinite amount of scroll. For a news site specifically, we've been importing our news from this particular file and then passing it into article list.json. Uh, we, we were passed down articles from, I think it was app.js? I'm not, no, I think it's a home page. So home page had an article list component which had a bunch of news that read from a specific file. Um, and that's okay for right now, but we wanna have dynamic data being fetched from an API. So when you start working on a full stack web development team, you're gonna have, generally speaking, hopefully you won't have to do both, but they are, based on the size of the company, you, you may or may not need to do both. There's gonna be backend engineers who deal primarily with like a language like Rails and talking with the database and providing data to the front end people. And you have the front end people who are gonna like take that data and then do something with it to show up on the page. Um, long, yeah. Long story short, you have backend developers who provide the data and front end developers who are going to consume it. Uh, today's challenge is not going to be a ton of actual React code, but it's mostly going to be using like Ajax and the concept of Ajax to grab outside data and bring that into your app. What's uh, the use like to make API uh, requests? What's that? Like, uh, like in, in Rails, you have like Faraday or something like that. You have Faraday, you had HTT party and things like that. JavaScript actually has stuff built in. Um, we Everyone uses Ajax, everyone uses something called fetch, and we'll cover that in, actually right now. Here's a very, very basic implementation of, uh, let me just do delete.js. I'll just save this somewhere here. This is a very, very basic implementation of Ajax. We learned this in week, I think it was five when we were starting to cover front end stuff and we, were, we went to JSON IP with the super leftist uh, stuff that was coming back to our, our screen. So it's basically we have dollar sign which stands for jQuery.ajax, which means this is an Ajax call. So I'm basically gonna say, I'm gonna make a request out to jsonip.com. And then based off of that, I'm gonna execute two things. If it's successful, I'm gonna get the data back and do something with it. If it's unsuccessful and there's an error of some sort, I'm going to just alert something went wrong. Maybe I'll just console log data. And we'll just run this in our browser to just see if anything works. So I have Ajax. Here, so I made an Ajax request to JSON IP and it's happening somewhere in the background. Like something is happening in the background and if it was successful, I would load up the data and just console log it out. And here again, like there's the, you know, the response that came from JSON IP. If something went wrong, then I would say something went wrong. So I'm just gonna change this to not, a, obviously not a real website. So this will give me some sort of error message. And it says something went wrong. So at the very core of it, this is like what a very, very simple like Ajax request looks like. And it's not a terrible way to fetch data and to do something with it. But the original purpose of Ajax, which I think was in 2010 or something like that, um, was basically meant to grab data from widgets, um, when uh, grab data from widgets and then bring it back to your page. And basically what happened is as the internet grew, this started becoming unusable, like this particular way of doing things. Right now it's very, very simple. So let's pretend that Facebook was a single page app and we're using Ajax to log in. So then we start with this, make an Ajax request. Once I log in, I'm going, if it's successful and I've authenticated myself, I'm going to show the home screen. If something else happens, I'm gonna say something went wrong. So this is like an ideal situation. But as we know from Facebook, there are posts and there are likes and there are comments and there are photos and there are stories and there are statuses and things like that. So more than likely, if you used Ajax, your code might look a little something more like this. So I go, I make an Ajax request to log in. If it is successful, you know, I'm going to load up all my posts. And if that is successful, then I'm gonna load up all my photos. Then I load all my statuses and comments and likes and things like that. 
But in the case that one of these breaks, like I make a request to posts and nothing works, um, I have to have an error like function to handle all everything that, hand, that goes wrong. Or maybe I have something like once the comments go wrong, I have to find the corresponding error that goes along with it. As you can see from this particular piece of code, this is, this is beginning to form what's called the uh, JavaScript Christmas, Christmas tree of doom. Uh, because it just looks like a Christmas tree, it's impossible to read. Or it's also called JavaScript hell, where you have different layers, where you have to know exactly where you are. This is very, very difficult to read. That, I think that's, that's the main point I'm trying to make. It's also not read top to bottom. It, instead, it's kind of read inside to outside, kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie or something like that. One of these things has to be, ex it's like, yeah, it has to, it reads from, yeah, inside to outside rather than top down, which is how most of us usually read things. So old school, like Ajax cannot work in today's, in today's world. Like it's just way too big. So they moved on to something called promises. So let's pretend for a second. This is still using Ajax. Let's pretend for a second that your house is a website and you want to buy new carpets for your house. Uh, I think there was a period of time when like hardwood was like the big thing, but I think people are starting to make a comeback, like carpet's starting to make a comeback. I don't know if people agree with that. Um, but let's pretend that buying your furnishing, like basically when you buy furnishings for your house off the internet, it's asynchronous, right? I go to a website like uh, amazon.com, I place an order for a brand new carpet or something like that. When I press uh, place my order, I don't get my item right away. Like it's not physically in my hands yet, but there's a promise which basically says, I'm gonna give you a receipt. And when I give you this receipt, it's like I'm promising that in some period of time in the future, you will get your item. So when you talk about this, like let's say you have a function called buy carpets for your living room. So you're gonna make an Ajax request for buying the carpet online. And then you just wait. You provide your money, your credit card information, you just wait. A lot of things are happening in the background. Their orders department has to take it. They have to verify that your credit card information is being is correct and it's not fraudulent. They have to make a request out to the bank. They have to do all these things in the background. But all you all you see is I press the button and then a, I have to wait. A few days later, if it was successful, I'm going to get my carpet. I'm going to place my carpet in the living room and say I love my new carpet. And if there was any errors along the way, um, I'm just going to call customer service. So this is the old way of doing things using Ajax. What you're gonna do nowadays is something called promises. It's like, just, it's just an upgraded version of Ajax and one day promises will not be, uh, will not be around. We're gonna use something called the fetch API. It's a little bit simpler and it reads everything top to bottom. So maybe you would want to like make a, uh, I'm gonna make a fetch request to buy carpet online. I'm going to do then return place carpet in living room. And it's slightly different, but it essentially does the same thing. So I'm making a fetch request to some sort of website. And then when I get some sort of response, then I will do this next piece of code. When that executes, then I will do another piece of code. What's the equivalent for a post? What's that? What's the equivalent for a post? Uh, we'll get there together. I think that's in like three days. Let's say again that your house is like a website. Let's say that we're gonna build a house, right? So I'm first going to make a request to build a house. And then once I get like, once I get a response of some sort of positive response, then I'm going to frame the house. And then after, after the, so first things first, I have to build the house. And then I frame the house and then I run the HVAC and the electricity through it. So this reads top to bottom, things are going to execute in one specific manner. Um, So the concept of promises in the real world, let's say, let's say for instance that you are buying a house or you're buying a condo or you've ever gone through that or seen someone go through that. 
unless you're like super baller um, and in which case you shouldn't be here at Code Platoon, you're most likely going to need to take out a mortgage, right? So when you go out and you buy a house, like you don't have $200,000, $300,000 in cash, right? You have 20,000, maybe $40,000 if you're, if you're really lucky. And uh, you have a promise from a bank that they will cover the rest of the, and then you'll take a mortgage out. Um, let, me, let me create this. Basically, JavaScript promises pr promise a value of something in the future. Similarly, when you're buying a house, like you don't have the cash on hand, but you say I'm pre-qualified for a mortgage with, you know, mortgage one or something like that. I don't know any mortgage vendors. Like Chase Bank. Chase Bank is your is your mortgage vendor. It's like I'm pre-approved for two hundred thousand dollars. I don't have it, but Chase does, and that I'm guaranteed. Like Chase is providing a promise, saying like I will pay you this amount of money, and that you know, John Day is able to borrow $200,000 and I, I will provide that money on behalf of John Day. And then similarly, when you talk about JavaScript promises, let's, let's try like building a house with using uh, promises. So we have this function called build a foundation. Okay. So this, this foundation is going to return a promise. Like I'm not going to be able to build it right away. Um, but what's going to happen is like basically I'm going to set a timer that's going to promise that we're going to resolve in a thousand milliseconds. And if it doesn't resolve in a thousand milliseconds, something else will happen. So I'm going to build the foundation and then like based off of that, I'm going to console log that the foundation is built. So let's copy this. We'll clear out this screen right here and we'll run it. Oh, whoops. Something is broken. That one resolves that one, this one resolves this one, this one resolves that one. No, oh, this should work. I'm not sure what's going on. Missing closing. Does anybody see the syntax error here? Oh, yes. Yeah, you're right. There it is. So we kind of see this in action. So again, I have this function called build foundation. And all build foundation does is that it returns a promise out to you, saying that I'm going to resolve myself. I'm going to set a timeout. Uh, and resolve in a thousand milliseconds. So when I called build foundation and I wrote dot then, uh, basically what I'm saying is run this first. At this point, this is just calling out to this line right here and returning a promise. This promise is basically just saying like, I've heard you, I'm going to do it sometime. And then afterwards, after a thousand milliseconds, then the foundation is going to be built. If I change this to you know, five, five, 5,000 milliseconds, it's gonna take five seconds. So one, two, three, four, there. Five, there it is, and the foundation is built. So it's a pro, like the idea of promises is very powerful. It's like, I don't have the time to do it right now, but I promise I will do it at a later point. So I'm gonna to continue to use promises to create my house. So first things first, I'm gonna build my uh, build my foundation. I'm gonna return a promise that's gonna set out a set a timeout of a thousand seconds, and then console log the foundation's built. Then I'm gonna frame my house. I'm going to you know build my HVAC. I'm going to build my electric, and so on and so forth. And then I'm gonna call it in a very specific order. This is gonna execute in the order that I want. So I'm gonna build the foundation. Then I'm going to build the frame. Then I'm going to build the HVAC. Then I'm going to build the electric. And you can kind of see these are all going to take a different amount of time to resolve. One second, two seconds, two and a half seconds. 
What are we passing this resolve reject if we don't use it? What's that? We will do that in just a second. So if I run this, I have a foundation, frame, electric, and HVAC. Foundation, electric, HVAC. Something, something went wrong. Something is being run before the other one. Hmm. Let's try this one more time. So you can kind of see that I've set all of these different, I've set all these different things from happening, right? I, I've said I'm going to build the foundation, then build the frame, HVAC, and electric. So I expect to see foundation, frame, HVAC, and electric built in that particular order. But instead, yeah, and um, then should we wait, right? Or then should wait. I don't know. Let's see. Let's run this. Yeah, let's let's see what's going on. So I expect to see foundation, frame, HVAC, and electric showing up. Foundation, frame, electric, and HVAC. You can kind of see this one jumped in right before HVAC. And what was the reason for that? It's 500 milliseconds difference. It's a 500 millisecond difference. So these are all, these are not running in order. Like this is saying like, I'm only going to take 2,500 milliseconds to resolve. And this one's taking, you know, 3,000 milliseconds to resolve. So this one's jumping in right before this. But I want to see things show up in a very specific order. So the way that I'm going to do that is using arrow functions, fat arrow functions, unfortunately, are back. I'm going to say, like, you have to do the resolve outside of the time now. I don't think so. I think all we have to do is this. The fat arrow functions will ensure that we're actually going to run this in our in this particular order. So we'll run this. Try it one more time. Foundation, frame, HVAC, and then electric. And then each one of those is going to take basically what was happening when I run it before without the federal function is it's just running. running it, it's just running in parallel. So it's going to be like whichever one finishes first is going to be whichever one finishes first. And the reason why this one finishes in order is because this takes one second, this takes two seconds, this takes three seconds, and then this takes 2,500 milliseconds, so two and a half seconds. So it's just flying out onto the screen in whatever order that it comes. But there are specific things that I want. Like I want, I'm, I don't want to build the HVAC into my house before the electric. I don't know if that's actually true, but you know, you don't want to ask somebody out before you like spend some time talking to them or something like that. But by having these arrow, fat arrow functions, this is ensuring that I'm actually going to be writing, running these in a specific order. So you can kind of see it took a little bit longer because it takes one second to build a foundation and then you know, two seconds to build the frame, two and a half seconds to run the HVAC, and then you have to wait another three seconds to get the electric. So it's not flying out all at one time, it's actually executing in that particular order. All right. Another concept that we're gonna have is something called fetch that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier. It's pre-built into every single console, so we don't have to worry about, you know, HTT party or Faraday or, you know, like there's a, there's a number of other Ruby gems that make HTTP requests. Everyone uses fetch. Like that is just what people use. So fetch is pre-built into all of your consoles and it's a bunch of promises that are chain, chained together. So if I have fetch right here, I'm making a request to local host 3000 or whatever your, whatever your, URL is going to be. When I get a response, I'm going to change that response into JSON. And then once I have that particular JSON, I'm just going to console log it out. Um, so let's actually make a request to new site three. So I'm going to CD into new site three. I'm going to run. What's that? What is the purpose of all the then statements? The thens are basically saying like, I'm going to like I'm going to make a request to the API. So before we had like the then fetch and then are basically the updated version of this giant gross Ajax thing. Mm -hmm. This gross Ajax thing was kind of like 
if you think, just think about Facebook, right? You get to the bottom of the page. Yeah. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't naturally wait. That's it. Fetch. It's not going to wait for your response. So it, it's, it is going to wait for your response, but it's just basically saying once the response is back. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's going on here. It's kind of like I'm making a fetch request to something, right? Yeah. And then I'm going to get a response. Once I get a response, then I'm going to take that response and turn it into JSON. Once that happens, I'm going to take that JSON and console log it out to the screen. It's just a way for you to like read in order, like from top to bottom, and like one thing will execute before the next thing. Whereas before it was kind of like, I'm going to get to a certain point, it's going to execute from the inside going all the way back out rather than top to bottom. But in reality, it's just a set of chain functions. It's a chain, it's a bunch of chain functions. They're just functions. calling them in. Yeah. Like if they have called, could have called it really anything. They could call it anything. Yeah. They, they might it's change. It's just a function, right? It's just a function, yeah. It's saying, do something and then wait. Once it's back, then do something else. Once that's back, then do something else. So we have. Thanks for asking those. Like, dude, just said equal, like, fetch that equals with some response. Yes. And then just throw in the response, response to JSON, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, you could totally do that. It's up to you, but it's kind of like it's extra code that you don't need to write, you know? For you. Yeah, it's kind of built in for you. Right now. Yeah. So we ran npm start. Um, it's running right here. This is what's going to look like by the end of today. I'm going to make a. Um, I'm going to make a request to localhost. There's going to be a. If you let me kill the server real quick. I have two servers running right now. So I have a web server. Um, that's loading up everything out here on localhost 3000. And then I have an API server running at 3001. So this, I have two servers running just by running npm start. I have one for what's showing up on the screen and then something in the background that's taking care of like hearing all of my requests and responding to them. It's something that's gonna be built in for you today. I think, let's find. So I'm going to make a request to localhost 3001 slash API slash articles. Get rid of all my comments. So I'm going to make a request to localhost 3001 slash API slash articles. I'm going to get a response back. Once I get it, I'm going to turn it into JSON. Once I get that JSON, I'm going to console log it. If this works, you can kind of see I was given a promise saying like, hey, I acknowledge you. Like this is very fast right now because it's just me. Like there's only one person making this request. But when you have, you know, hundreds of millions of people making requests, they can't respond all at the same time. They just need to acknowledge, I heard you, I'll get to you. I heard you, I'll get to you. Kind of like the DMV. Um, so I, it gave me a, returned me a promise saying it was pending. And then once I got a response back, it turned into JSON. That JSON got console logged out to the screen. And here are all of my, like here are now all of my, you know, articles that I had a little bit earlier. Let's say I wanted to make a request to articles slash two, like one specific article. Let's see what I would get from there. So I got a, I got a promise right away, and then I got my actual article that came back to me in, in console log form. Right. Something else that you're going to need for today and tomorrow's material is something called the component life cycle. It's a fancy term, but it's not, it's, it's not especially like challenging or anything like that. Let's, talk, let's start with a component in its natural state. This is what is automatically loaded when you run create react app. I have like, you know, imp import react and component logo and everything like that. And this is just a very, very basic component. Uh, you could also have a constructor. So you have a render on every screen, but you might have a constructor as well, where we're going to receive props. And what are props again, Alex? Uh, variables passed down from or passed into it. And whatever component calls it. Yeah, exactly. It's like 
So each, you can think of each, each component as like a child of something else and I'm providing it stuff. So if I'm gonna call a component inside of this return here, I'm gonna pass down props if I wanted to have something. So yeah, you can think of these as props are just parameters. Maybe I'll have, uh, I'll, if I had taken props, I will need to super the props and then I'm gonna have like this.state equals something. Maybe I'll have a bunch of articles just to get started. There's something that you'll see, something called component did mount. That does something else. Component did mount is basically one of eight life cycle methods that comes built into React components. And what, what it ends up being is it looks a little something like this. So there are eight component life cycle methods. And basically what these life cycle methods do is they allow you to hook into a component at a specific point in their quote unquote life in order to achieve various things. So we start at the 12 o'clock position. Um, we say like once the component will mount, like before it mounts, like will, like before anything happens, like this, this is where it's going to start. You can think of it to be synonymous to like Rails is like before action or before save or before validate or something like that. Those are called action, active record callbacks. So it's kind of like before, like before anything gets saved into the database, there's a whole bunch of things that are available. Like uh, there's a before save, I might do something. After you save it, I might do it. Before I create it or before validate, before destroying and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of things that you can do prior to, like during the entire process of saving something to a database. And uh, there's the before action, your controllers, before any of these controller actions are taken, I'm gonna run through this piece of code. Similarly in React, that's this component lifecycle. We start at this 12 o'clock position with will mount. This is before, the. this is saying like, before the component will mount on the screen, I will execute some piece of code. Once the component did mount on the screen, like I'm going to execute some other piece of code. Before, then it's gonna receive props. And when, before it receives props, I will, I will do some piece of code. When it updates, will update, render, did update, and will unmount. So I start here at the will mount, that's the birth of the component. And then the will unmount is the death of the component when the component goes away. You take a look at this image right here. We have essentially component did mount in action. So let's say we have a, let's say we had a home page component similar to what we saw yesterday. This home page is going to, you know, receive some props. We have some articles, and there are two lifecycle methods um, called component will mount and component did mount here. So once the component did mount onto the screen, once the DOM renders it onto the screen, I'm just gonna say get articles, like this.get articles, so homepage.get articles. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to do articles API, which is gonna be our own you know, React, React class. We're gonna fetch articles, and then we're, once we get that JSON back, we're gonna set the state for articles to be JSON. And then from there, we, you know, pass it down into article list, so on and so forth, rather than reading it all at one time from an empty source. Once the component, the homepage component mounts onto the screen, we're gonna make an API call right away. Similarly, it's kind of like, once I reach the bottom of the component, uh, I'm making this up, once I reach the bottom of the component that handles facebook.com of the current page, I'm going to make a request in the background and then add it to my state and just add it on to the bottom of the page. This is just because hypothetically you might have old data from your first time it runs around. It might just be like in the site for like hours, like surfing through the news, and then it could it, it it could be that it's mostly yeah it's just it's just making a new a fresh request. That's what it's doing. So this component did mount is going to be one of the most commonly used when you call out to separate APIs. Um, another one that you may use is component will receive props. So it's like once, you, like it will receive properties down from a, from a parent down to a child. And once it receives those properties, I will do something with them. Um, 
Yeah, so basically today's challenge, if you take a look at github.com slash delta news site three, basically what you're going to do today is you're going to wire up, oh, this is not what I want, server source API. There is an articles API, um, there's, there's an articles API class, like JavaScript class. You're going to wire up this particular module to like do all that fetching for you. Like where am I going to fetch from? Um, and then you're going to connect this particular API to your components. And you're going to want to use component did mount similarly to what we did right here. So once the homepage loads, I will, I will make some sort of API request using this particular class. So we want, single responsibility, everything. Any questions on fetch, on API calls and promises and com component lifecycle? We moved a little quickly. 